Hey guys, welcome back to the Shintar Higashi Show with Peter Yu. Uh, first and foremost, shintarhigashi.com. I have some instructionals out. Please check them out. This is sponsored by my website, shintarhigashi.com. <laughs> Not like a big Fortune 500 company or a big company. It's just me, right? Did you pay yourself like marketing fees? <laughs> no, it means that I bought this headset. That's what, that's what that means. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, instructionals out. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about different teaching styles. Jonathan Potter emailed yeah. me and specifically said, hey, you know, I had two major judo teachers influences on me in my life. So I realized how judo can be from different teacher to teacher. So, you know, that's where he wanted to ask, like, what is my yeah. teaching style? Is it the same as my father's, et cetera, et cetera. Right. It was a very thoughtful, well-written email. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Um, yeah. So we will take it away. I know. Like, so he specifically mentioned your style, the difference between your style your teaching style and your father's teaching style. Yeah. I think we talked about that a lot, not specifically focused on it, but it alluded to it. So yeah, what, what is, what's the story there? So there's like many different schools of thoughts on this, right? And then traditionally judo is like, Hey, here are the moves. Osoto, mm -hmm. Ochi, Tayo, Ippon Senai. These are the moves. Go train it with each other. Go do it on right. each other. Right. And that's always been sort of how they did it in Japan, you know, mm -hmm. because you have tons of time. Tons of time, tons of people. So you have Bullying unlimited down. resources, think about it, right? And you have all these people doing it with unlimited amount of time. Okay, here are the moves. Go figure it out. Go do it on each other. Right? And generally, the people who are the most athletic, the most coachable, who has these like athletic traits, like learning, coachable, well, these kinds of people naturally stay in the sport and they develop nuances and start putting these moves together. Right? Naturally. Naturally, you know? Right. And you start getting a feel for it, right? And then it's a feel intuition based thing, like, oh, I'm in trouble here. But it's mm -hmm. not quite like, hey, why? You know? It's like right. not like conscious why this is that, this that this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was never usually taught explicitly back in the day. Right. They, it, it your, never was. your father was learning it. Yeah, and, that's how the way my father yeah. learned. And then many yeah. generations of judo teachers talk this way, right? But yeah. now, because we don't have the numbers to support this kind of training, right? If you have a hundred people on the mat, hey, go figure it out. A lot of people are going to figure it out. Yeah. And but no, you have a class of 15 people, right? And it's all sorts of varying skill levels. Right, right. Right. And then it's not unlimited time because you don't train for four hours like you do in Japan every day. Mm -hmm. You do a one hour, two hour class two or three times a week. Yeah. So teaching has to be explicit. What are the positions you're looking for? Why are we looking at those things? And then they have to not be communicated in a much more different way, you know? Yeah. So that's the style that I've embraced over the years. You know, teaching so how style, did, right? How did that change came about? Cause, uh, come about? Because as a kid, you definitely practice how your father taught you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Just you learn the basic mechanics of the moves and then you... Mm -hmm go and try it out right yeah but yeah and you have success you have success in that you're right. already a uh, national international level competitor yeah by the time you're in your 20s yeah so when did that change in thought or style teaching stuff come about you know little by little right i started to sort of see like a flaw in the way people taught and learned you know yeah and for instance going against a tall lefty that came over my back okay yeah All right, what does that even mean you know, I have inside position. He has outside position. He's much more taller than me. How many, how many inches? Maybe six to eight inches taller than me, right? Right, Not right. a tall guy, you know? All right, so what is the solution to that? You know, and I've asked this question many, many times to people, you know? Some of the best coaches in the world would be like, Kyle, you know, drop Senagi. Mm -mm. But it was missing so much context. Right. Right. How do you even get to yeah. drop Yeah, is it like Nagi? deep over the back or is it over the shoulder? What is my yeah. other hand doing? This is, what about my foot position? Is it inside foot yeah. position or outside foot position? What techniques does this guy do? You know, like all these different things, like almost minutia, right? Like, but they're very, very important, relevant pieces of the case that should be mentioned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that just gets <laughs> yeah. to the side. You know what I mean? We are laughing because there's a little bit of inside joke here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, there was a little minutia because. These good coaches, especially from Japan, they figure them out naturally because they probably have gone against tall lefties. 
They probably, probably have, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then, so these are things that most of the experienced athletes don't even think about, right? So if yeah. he's tall and he has inside foot position, I'm in trouble. Big Uchimata is coming, right? But most good guys who are good at Senagi and have very relatively skill, near skill sets are going to try to game inside foot position as well, right? To be able right. to turn, you know? So that is like a precursor. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if I'm a great tall guy, I'm coming over the back and I have the inside foot position, I'm not trying to set up Tanya Toshi there. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, what is this tall guy mm -hmm. looking for? You know? And just the fact that all the best coaches couldn't give me good nuance advice on that specific yeah, position yeah. led me to kind of go down the rabbit hole of like, okay, what is going on here? And then try to decipher and understand and decode all the stuff that was happening. You know? So now when someone else asked me the similar question, I can give a little bit of a better answer. You know what because I mean? Because you, you've gone through that thought process yourself. Yes. Yes. You started, so basically you started thinking this way because of your own needs. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. You know, and then let's say same tall person, they have inside position and they have a strong post. Yeah. How do you get rid of it? Right. And then a lot of people will say, okay, you know, you punch the inside of the elbow, right. To make their elbow bend. And then you put your elbow over it. Mm -hmm. Great. Right. That's one solution. If yeah. I just look for that, it'll never work. Right. 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 So it's like, all right, how do I add more things and more depth and more layer to that? You know? I attack Kosoto, he's stepping out, and then I do it. You know what I mean? I try to punch it, it doesn't do it, so then I grab my own lapel and try to cut it. Mm -hmm. Right? So now I have two or three different methodologies to go into that, right? So it's contextual. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm looking for that far sleeve go Ipon Senagi wants. So make him think right. about that far sleeve. Now he's thinking about that Ipon Senagi, and then I punch his hand. And now I could bend it. You see what I mean? Right. So now right. there's like four or five, six different methodologies just to do that one thing that's been taught. You know what I mean? So how do I teach that? Right. Yeah. And I wish somebody were able to verbalize it and communicate this idea to me. You know? When you were Even, when you were growing up. Yeah. And still you see this to this day when you ask the teacher, hey, how do you clear the knee shield in jujitsu? Uh, push it down, you go like this. You go like this, you go like that, right? But there's some nuanced things like, hey, you push it down, he opens like this. Then you may try to game this position. Maybe you go for this. Maybe you go for that. You know, what is his collar? And if he's pulling your head down and you can't posture up, you can't do it, right? You can't do any of this shit. Mm -hmm. Right, So right. if he's doing that, you have to clear that collar hand first so you can posture up and then work that legs, right? Yeah. So as you're doing it, he may start fishing for that collar grip. You have to protect it. So you have to kind of like step back and work on something else and then return to that new shield. You see what I mean? So yeah. like this kind of, how do you teach that? How do you communicate that? You know, what are the I goals think, yeah. of each position? And, you know, like you said, there was the needs of me wanting to learn this stuff that no one was able to express this to me. That led me to my teaching style, which is sort of like this conceptual goal oriented thing. You right. Know? So you, you, you specify the goal of, oh, uh, going back to that example of big lefty. Like you're in this uh, disadvantageous position. What do you do? Yeah. That's the goal. Like, oh, it's drops here. That is a good option. And then you try to point out all the different avenues to get to the goal state. Yes. Yes. That's, yes. Yeah. Yes. What are my objectives? So, what are the other guys' objectives? Right. Because when you yeah. teach somebody, this is what you do. Go here, go yeah. there, go here, go there, go here. You're not really taking into account what the other guy's doing. Right. But you can't right. go over every single thing that the other guy wants to do because you don't know that. Right. Yeah. So you kind of have to generalize it and say, hey, theoretically or conceptually, this person is looking for these things. I want to keep those things in mind and address those things, but we're working. This is my goal here. You know what I mean? Yeah. That was going to be, that was actually going to be my next question. Yeah. Like you can, there's so many different ways to do it. And then you can, you can't possibly explain all the diff, uh, no. details, right? Yeah. Well, how do you cover all the grounds? I mean, you spent a lot of time thinking about it and training for it. Yeah. Well, you know, hobbies like myself just don't have that luxury. Yeah. But at the same time, like I say, if you just show a few ways, it would, it, you may miss a lot of, your student may miss a lot of details. So you may, they may not even be able to get there and then they'll yeah. come back to you and then complain that it, things work. don't work. Yeah. 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 So, so how do you yeah. balance that? So the first thing that you need to be able to do is to make the shape of the movement, right? So you have yeah. to do it slow, completely unresisting. That's step number one. Progression two yeah. 
is getting in there and feeling it out. So you have a feel, right? So you understand conceptually yeah. in your mind, like these are the necessary steps. These are my goals. What does that feel like? What does that look like when I'm looking at this freaking guy in the eye? You, right. you know what I mean? Right. What is the necessary like sort of precursor? For instance, like if I have the strong pulse and it's posted on my chin tight, right? And yeah. I can't close my distance, it feels a certain way. Like I'm stuck there. Okay. So if I want to clear that inside arm and I'm popping it, you know, like you got to play around with it a little bit to get comfortable right. with the movement, comfortable with the resistance, you know? Yeah. So you have to slow it down 10%, 20%, and sort of little by little play fight. It's like the Russian methodology, you know? I see. You got to put yourself there and you got to do reduced speed, reduced intensity, slowly working on these things. And that's what I'm doing now in jiu-jitsu because I'm trying to learn like a spider lasso situation, mm. right? Oh. Yes. You're a dirty guard puller now. I am. <laughs> I did jiu-jitsu this morning. I pulled guard like 19 times today. Oh man! <laughs> no. At least you try, did you fake Tomoe Nagi or you just straight up set? I literally just sat down. <laughs> uh oh! Yeah, I learned how to pull guard, guys. Nice. I mean, there's a lot of details in there. You can't just jump into it. Kind there's of, yeah. A lot of... <laughs> Somewhat. Yeah. I'm trying to get good on the ground, you know. So it's like, it's yeah. Uh, why would I do stand up? You know. Yeah. If the guy wants <laughs> to learn stand up, I'll play there. Yeah. I'll play there a little bit. Right. Right. I've had that. But right now I'm really trying to get better at guard stuff. So yeah. I'm, you know, pulling guard. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's how you do it. You know, the, yeah. the way you described it. Okay. So I've been, uh, I've been trying to get better at skiing. Like I, I realized that my form hasn't been the best. Yeah. And I've been watching, I, uh, I could only go out two days this week, uh, this season, mm. but I really focus on working on my form and then yeah. the, all the ski instructors actually say a very similar thing as you do yeah. because ultimately there's so many ways to get that perfect carving turn, you know, that Instagram, like, mm. you know, highlight turns, but then the important thing is that eventually you want to feel, you want to understand the feel of that yeah. movement. Yeah. You don't, you can't just think about all the mechanics, you know, the good instructors will first show what the mechanic, explain the mechanics of it is, yeah. and then maybe suggest you some drills so that you can get the feel of that mechanic, correct mechanics. And yeah. eventually the goal is for the student to ha understand the feel and then just do it naturally. Yes. Yeah. Cause right? you can sit there and explain to them and give yeah. them a dissertation on like, you should right. feel a slight pressure on the inside foot wow, and then you're, you're leaning at a yeah. 45 degree angle and then. Yeah. You're pushing and pulling, and then you're driving your. It's like none of this shit matters. You know, yeah. some of it matters in the beginning, but if you right. give them all that in the beginning, they're not going to have to process all in that information. Yeah. So, where yeah. is their attention on? You know? Yeah. For me, so it's like when I'm showing judo stuff, it's like, all right, right, first, right, your hand is higher than their hand. Yeah. A little bit more leverage for a soto. Here we go, bang, you know? But to move off from what this guy's asking, like, how is my judo skill not just like, teaching about my style of judo different from my father's yeah. you know uh yeah to answer that it's very different as well you know like uh i don't do any of this oh, stuff. but not even not even just teaching style now it's like your judo style very different and so it can yeah. be more different you know and you know you get two guys your tall guy short guy you know very very different types of style generally people say yeah. like oh shorter guys have an advantage in judo taller guys have an advantage in judo no, it's how you play oh, the yeah. game, what your strategy yeah. is. You know, if you're a shorter guy, if you're five five and fighting in the two twenty division and everyone's six foot and above and you develop like an Osoto Uchimata game, it's you're not gonna throw anybody with that. Well, yeah. 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 You know what I mean? And that's kind of the problem. You know, you're a heavier guy fighting in the dojo and everybody is average height, and now you all of a sudden develop your judo that way and you compete in a tournament and everyone's six two, six three, you're gonna have a hard time getting that overhand grip. Right, right. You know? So a lot of how I developed my judo was like cutting the hand and gaining two on ones, you know, not two on mm. one in the Russian style, but I have two hands on me as one hand on because I'm completely controlling yeah. that sleeve hand. But that's the style that sort of developed myself. You know, my father always had like, this is a video, uh, my father's judo system, Nobuyoshi yeah. judo system, red belt judo system. You guys should check that out on YouTube. It's very, very interesting and power oriented. It's uh, right Osoto, left Osoto, right Kochi, left Kochi and Harai. Yeah, off the I double collar. It. It's like such a savage system, right? Absolutely very simple. Good yeah, very simple, but you know, 
It's wild. And he, it's wild. It's it, and he he said back back when he was doing judo, there were no uh, there was no weight classes, and no. he had to play a lot of big guys too, right? Uh, and, no. I wonder how he developed a system playing these big guys yeah. at his college. Yeah. Because Kokuchka is known for his heavyweights, right? Yeah. And he would do a lot of hanging stuff, chopping the knees from the side, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's a very uh, <laughs> nasty, cool. nasty move. Yeah. yeah his Osoto wasn't like a clean Osoto. Everything I say to not do, he did to like chop that knee in half. And I and, see. But you know, that, so, that's how you did judo back then. No one gave a shit yeah. about your knees. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So if you if you strain your knee, you just like tape it and then they keep going or something, right? Yeah. Back yeah. in the days. Yeah. When you're looking for a good judo teacher, though, you want a teacher that knows a lot of positions too. You want to yeah. have their expertise, right? And then they should be learning as they you're learning, right? Yeah. And sometimes you don't want to teach only the stuff you know because sometimes you need to be forced to teach tomonage and all these things. So the sensei yeah. grows too because you can't teach one system. The one system for everybody doesn't really work. You know what I mean? Uh, mm. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know? Um, like Jimmy Pedro has his gripping system, right versus right. left, right versus right. He's very similar. He drills it into his guys, and that's all they do, and they excel at it. I was a beneficiary of that system, right? Right, right. But if you're running a dojo, a commercial gym, most guys aren't competitors. You know, people want to be intrigued. People need differentiated instruction, you know, to feel like they're being taught something and that they can learn and thrive, then you have to have an instructor that knows a lot of different positions, a lot of different things. You know what I mean? So they have to personally be going out there learning themselves. They also have to be teaching stuff that they're not fully comfortable with so they get to work out their material as if they were stand-up comedians right. or open mics. You know? So sometimes oh. when I have a smaller group class, yeah. yeah, let's say, you know, President's Day, we didn't close the adult class, you know, nine people show up, Right? All right, guys, we're going to do something a little bit different today here. You know, we're going to do Sode, drop Sode to the weak side. And it's a lot more safe because there's a lot less people. And I can yeah. monitor each person doing this thing. And I'm learning the best way to teach this thing. Right, right. You know what oh. I mean? Yeah. So you don't really go for your own, like, sh Shintaro Yagashi style of judo. Like, kind of like how I know, like you mentioned, Jimmy Pedro has his gym has its own style yeah. and I I think you've mentioned how Jason Morris yeah. jam that was all similar moves or yeah. something. but you don't want you don't necessarily want to go for that kind of like distinguishing I mean there's style. similarities right like uh, there's like yeah. certain principles that are it's a non-negotiable you have to fight for position right. you know I don't want anyone like gooning the other person over with a forceful move or anything like that you know right, so right. technique and position first and foremost cutting angles all these concepts is universal but I want them to people to develop their own stock you know and if you look at the guys in the dojo there's people who have judo identical to mine right mm. almost as close as it can get right and people have completely look at chow yeah oh yeah he has this whole crazy style you remember oleg i don't yeah oleg, oh, yeah, oleg. Yeah. Yeah. oleg does everything i tell him not to do <laughs> I, and I, found I, success in doing everything i told him not to do you know yeah. so like that's something and then you you know, look at a new kid like Juni, who's like crushing it right now, completely different style, yeah. you know? And uh, I, I like that kind of innovation, you know, in the room. Yeah. And people develop in their own styles, you know? And I think it's very important. You know, I think the, Jonathan mentioned something about like a community judo club with a teacher that does nine to five, regular nine yeah. to five. Uh, I think that's tough, you know, when you have a teacher like that, because, you know, where, where do they personally grow, you know? Yeah, it's just, yeah. you can't have time if to. If you have yeah. time in the day to like watch judo videos and do judo and train other styles and train with other people, you, you're going to reap those benefits too. You know, so uh, that's a lot of the issue with some of these dojos. People have nine to fives. I'm not telling people to quit their nine to fives, right? Yeah. But it would be nice if you had more full time judo teachers who can, you know, yeah, who can develop, develop their, their own press, and yeah. train and all, do all the stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we talked, we dedicated an episode about that. Yeah. You know, so check that out, guys. And anything else we missed? No, that's pretty much it. So I hope all yeah. that was interesting to you guys. Uh, sometimes I ramble and it's not make any sense. And, you know, I want to give it the to most me. pertinent information that's relevant to what we're talking about. You know, the baseline. I mean, 
<laughs> oh, not missing anything. You know, yeah, same, all the details. Yes, exactly. Not leaving out key pieces of information. <laughs> yeah, we don't do that here. No, not at this. Here. No more information. Got, here, yeah. Got to show. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, uh, yeah, like Jonathan did, you guys could, you know, shoot us an email yeah. or support us on Patreon and join our Discord server and then talk to us. Yep. Uh, we actually get most of our suggestions that way. Um, so thanks for listening, guys. Well, this was interesting to you guys, and yeah. we'll see you guys in the next episode.